obviously they've legalized marijuana now in yeah. four different states. I, I know smoking weed through vaping is big as well. Well, I haven't tried that, but we did go to uh, Seattle recently where it's completely legal and you can go buy a rolled up joint for $5 and they'll deliver it to you. Yeah. It's completely legal. But let me tell you something. I'm on the hunt for marijuana stocks in Australia. Yes. Marijuana is the next cash crop. I don't care what people say about the long term. It's only a matter of time. Only a matter of time. And I, f- I figure the first guy that bought you know, into tobacco stocks, he doesn't know how to spend his money. No. So listen, everybody, I'm buying marijuana stocks. Hey everybody, how you guys doing? My name is Jordan Michaelides, I'm one of the founders at Neural. Neural is focused on the exponential elite, that is males and females who are well educated, tech savvy, hungry for improvement and always pushing to increase their human intelligence. The question is though, how do they reach that level of fulfillment that the exponential elite go for when without having to spend a lifetime looking for it? So we're looking at people like Elon Musk, the Oprah Winfrey's of the world, Steve Jobs, and thinking about quotes uh, that Charlie Munger, with his worldly wisdom, have coined um, from Abraham Maslow, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So the Uncommon Podcast interviews high performers and unique personalities to identify commonalities in their knowledge, their practices, their mindsets, their tools, uh, so we can improve. So... Doing that allows our uh, community to build their uncommon sense, hence the name Uncommon. You can learn a bit more, head to neural.com slash podcast, that is N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E dot com slash podcast. This podcast has been an experiment and we need your feedback as a subscriber. So leave us a review, make your way to learn more about the competition and prizes that we have going. Uh, that is at neural.com slash podcast, N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E. Some of the prizes include an Apple Watch 2 for all you high performers out there, a Kindle Paperwhite for you book nerds, an Amazon gift card for everyone else. We, You can also sign up to our, I guess, weekly brain food, which is the Monday Morsels at neural.com slash sign up. Make sure you check it out. So in this episode, we have recorded with Adrian Stone and I first met Adrian a few years ago. This is at his office hours, the free time that he sort of plots in his calendar to bounce off tech ideas and he shot my idea down pretty hard but it was a lot of fun and that soon progressed to catching up in Teslas, funnily enough. Um, Adrian is an angel investor and entrepreneur who's done immense work in the Melbourne startup scene. He's well known for running one of Australia's earliest accelerators called AngelCube and also for voicing an array of opinions over Twitter. Adrian now spends a lot of his time on unique uh, venture capital investments and is slowly working on a a tiny little publication called Seven, if you can find it. We've linked that in our show notes, so make sure you check it out. Some of the topics we included uh, for the podcast today, his first job at Tandy, Uh, what it took to become an entrepreneur and eventually an investor, Uh, instilling an entrepreneurial spirit as a father. Um, His son Adam has done quite a lot of work with Speed Lancer, which you should definitely check out. Uh, On indirect lessons from his parents, how he picks angel investments, recommended go-to books for gifting, things he believes in that others may not. Um, These are just some of the topics... It was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Uh, thanks for listening and enjoy. All right, we're live. Thank you for joining. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, I want to start with just a little short bio on who the, I guess, not so small time VC is. <laughs> um, you know, what are you known for? What do you What do you currently work on? How have you come to to where you are today? Okay, so uh, I started my life. Um, 
as an entrepreneur. Well, I didn't start my life as an entrepreneur. I, I lie. I went to university and I had a job, part-time job, going through, um, you know, while I was going through uni at what was called Tandy Electronics, okay. which is now defunct, I think, or pretty much close to defunct. Yeah. And they were going to make me a store manager. And the, the very day I graduated... The uh, area manager came to me and said, congratulations, we're going to make you a store manager, which is a big thing when you're 21 years old. And that same day, I got an offer from IBM to join them as part of their graduate program. So okay. I had to say no, and I took that up. Yeah. So I worked at IBM for... I, w- I was there for six years extremely happily. IBM in the 80s, and this is giving my age away, I'm 58. So IBM in the 80s was like, it was cool. It was like Apple today. So yeah. if you said you worked for Apple today, everyone thinks, oh, wow, you're cool. Yeah. And uh, so I worked at IBM in that era. It was amazing. Uh, we, we, were like, we called ourselves the Rat Pack. There were a group of us that joined at the same time. It was first job. We got you know, good per diems, good salaries. We got lots of trips paid for by the company. And we did good things, but, I mean, it was just rock and roll the whole time. It was also the disco era, so, you know, that's my, that's my music. Yeah. And, but six years in, I suddenly got this entrepreneurial seizure. I suddenly decided I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I had no idea how to go about doing it. So from being absolutely enamored with this job and think I'd never leave, suddenly after six years I was miserable for no reason. It was like a switch. Yeah. And for the next four years I went thought through ideas and I, and I slacked off at work as much as possible and just cycled through ideas. I was just a wannabe entrepreneur. Uh, what do you think that switch was? What was the feeling? I just don't know. It just, it, look. Because like I'm, a lot of people say that it's just having the freedom to define your own situation. Look, I was very happy at IBM and I thought I would be there. My whole life was, a v- the culture was very free. I, you could do what you wanted. It was a very entrepreneurial culture, surprisingly, for a large organization. I just think I always had that in me and it mm. didn't express itself. Right. Until that point when it suddenly... Just flicked. It was literally like a switch. I just remember it happening. Yeah. And uh, it, it was just, as I said, I just cycled through four years of misery. I ended up leaving. IBM had a 10-year vesting period on their superannuation in those days in, in that you contributed, okay. but you didn't get any money back out unless you were there for 10 years. Wow. And I left exactly six months before that. Wow. <laughs> because uh, my father, who just started a small finance company, a one-man business, said, to me, do you want to join me? And I said, yes. It was like a spur of of the moment. I'd never thought I'd be working with my father. I mean, that's really loser territory. So I did. I left IBM after nine and a half years, uh, threw away my my suits, and I spent my time going uh, from panel beater to panel beater with a checkbook writing them checks because we bought their insurance invoices from them. Uh, And that's what I did for the next two years, and I found that... (coughs) intensely liberating after nine and a half years of you know, corporate bullshit yeah. even though i enjoyed my job but the corporate world is let's face it it's all bullshit yeah. so if you're listening you work in the corporate world you know exactly what i'm talking about yeah. you really want to be out partying you don't want to be there but that's what you have to do <laughs> there's a lot of fluff there's a lot of fluff and so i did that for a couple of years and unfortunately my father got sick and i knew nothing about business but my father got sick he had to pull away from the business and he passed away uh, not that long thereafter and I was really stuck with a finance company. I had no idea how to run. Mm-hmm. And uh, at the same time, the bank pulled their funding on us. So two disasters at the same time. Then I became an entrepreneur. <laughs> That's the day I became an entrepreneur. Yeah. Uh, I went with my accountants and we went to uh, the four major banks. When we went to National Australia Bank, we sat down with them, told them what my business was. And all I really had was a customer list. That was all that was left. Mm. And lo and behold, they gave us $2.5 million of... 100% unsecured funding. Wow. What year, what year was this? This is 1993 or 94, maybe? 93. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, were you born in 93? Uh, I was 90. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I was three. Yeah, yeah, you I was three. playing with my own shit. <laughs> yeah, and so was I, literally. <laughs> I was in the shit. <laughs> and uh, so I restarted my finance uh, company. And, and interesting enough, uh, I've... People say focus, and my wife has always said that to me, focus, focus, focus. I've always had two businesses running in parallel. Mm. I've never had one because the finance company that ran in the background was a cash cow. didn't make much money, but it made like five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month. Yeah. I drew virtually no salary. We lived off my wife's salary. She was okay. in IT at Telstra. It's a very, very handy thing yeah. to have. Yeah. It was very important. And yeah. she drew... Like she had a salary of like sixty thousand dollars a year, which was like wow. big money in those yeah. days. 
And I was drawing 30000 from the business. I was the lowest paid employee. Right. And I started another company, and it was that company that I ran in parallel. I bootstrapped it off the back of my finance company, so it made five grand a month. Mm -hmm. My new business lost five grand a month and bootstrapped up, and uh, eventually I took that to the USA, sold it in 2006. Okay, and this was Sure Plan, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, Sure Plan, very good. Yeah, you've done your research. I have. Yeah, nobody knows about Sure Plan. Well, it's it's very interesting, and I think we'll come to some lessons. I think that that you've learned, no doubt, from that well, the, from that business. The first lesson I've learned is that when you name your company, check it with some people, because I thought Sure Plan meant to do with insurance and planning, because we were a claims management business. Right. Everyone I spoke to thought it was family planning. Okay, <laughs> Sure Plan, wow. go figure. I mean, look, maybe, yeah, you're, prob- you're probably right. You could probably assume it's something related to that. So, sure plan, you did that for 18 years? Uh, yeah, so mid-90s, I sort of started that. In 1998, we signed a huge contract with uh, a company called Lease Plan, a fleet leasing company. Yeah. So I learned the and and for sure plan all of our clients are enterprise clients. Oh, so right, it was okay. like Sharp, it was city councils in in you know like Parramatta City Council in Sydney was our very first client. Hornsby Shire Council in Sydney was our second client, and we managed them from Melbourne. Right. So it was a great proof of our system. But we learned the hard lesson. It takes like eighteen months to two years to sign up an enterprise client. And in Australia, just too few people to generate a high revenue line. Mm. So I was making maybe $20,000 revenue a year from a major corporate client, and it took me 18 months to sign them up. It wasn't, you know, it, the numbers don't stack up. Yeah. So we're very lucky that we signed on Lease Plan because Lease Plan was a fleet leasing company, and they were effectively a reseller of our services. Mm. So they bought us 20,000 vehicles in one go. Yeah. That was their client base. So we learned the lesson about finding distribution channels. Okay. And so for those listening at home, Showplan was essentially a, an insurance, I mean, from what I could understand, an insurance company that automated the process of claims is that right yeah we 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 worked like the claims department of an insurance company okay Uh, but for an insurance company the claims department is the arse end of the business the people are in it are just there are the lowest ranking employees in the organization yeah insurance companies are really investment companies yeah they are what they do is they get your premiums they stick them in a big bucket they spend it on buying buildings probably this one that you're uh, that we're in right now (laughs) renting it to you and then during the year, they pay out claims as they have to. Mm. And they, that's, that's the basement people. The, the claims department does that. And the people are generally unmotivated. They're generally not the most senior people in the organization. There's generally no career path. We made that a profit center. Mm-hmm. And we were vastly superior to insurance companies at doing that piece. Yeah. And we sold that service. It was like a SaaS business nowadays, I guess, because we had software, but we also had people. And we were very, very efficient, very, very good at it. We were, became world leaders. Yeah. And well, you took it to the US, didn't you? Well, I did because Australia was just too small. You know, I yeah. ran around in circles uh, trying to work out how to make money in this business, and two things really strange happened. When we signed up Lease Plan, and then we signed up Australia Post, and then we also signed up May Nicholas, uh, who had the biggest trucking company in Australia in those days, which they since sold off, uh, we lost more money. Right. So then I learned about break even points. It was a labour based business, okay. claims in those days so in the year 2000 we created an internet business now think about the year 2000 Mm. that was the dot-com era yeah i could have floated my company people told me i should i thought how can i float a company that's just got an idea and a piece of paper and is not making any money so i didn't (laughs) thank goodness but we created one of the first complete logistics systems on the internet we had no idea what we're building we just built what we thought was logical and our labor costs dropped dramatically. So we used to have 30 staff. We only needed 20 staff. Right. And then we quadrupled our business and added two people. And suddenly from a loss-making business, we were wildly profitable. Yeah. Okay. And so from lease plan? Well, but then the problem was we were profitable, but I did some numbers on the back of an envelope and realized that we would need every one of the top 1,000 companies in Australia to generate a business that I could sell for $5 million one day. Right. That's not going to happen. Yeah. And I wasn't going to build a business if I couldn't sell it for at least $5 million one day. Okay. And people listening will say, well, hang on, Facebook's worth $25 billion. Okay, I was not, never going to build a Facebook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was a guy drawing $30,000 a year from my salary. $5 million sounds like a lot of money. Yeah. And to me, it still is. 
And that was my goal. And when I realized that I could not possibly build that business in Australia, and it only took me nearly 10 years to make that mindset, that decision, yeah. hopped on the plane, we went to America. Okay. Literally, I told my wife, and she said, you know, you're right, we've got to pull our kids out of school, we've got to move, and we did. Yeah. And how much time did you spend in the States? Four, uh, four and a half, nearly five years. Okay. And we only came back because we sold the business. Yeah. Now, the business was sold, to, and you were still involved? So, yeah, I was involved. So when you sell a business, yeah. uh, you usually have a thing called an earn out. Mm. So, you know, the, the negotiation <laughs> for the business was really, really interesting. The, uh, I sold my Australian business, and then I sold my US business to the same company, but separately. Okay. And the reason was they approached me. Well, I, they didn't really approach me. I found them four years before and nurtured them for four years until the price was right. And they bought my Australian business on a multiple of how much profit it could make. Mm-hmm. And that was all good and dandy, but my US business was brand new, wasn't making any money. Mm-hmm. And I knew they would just say, well, bundle it in and we'd buy the whole lot Fair, and the price would be the multiple. price. Yeah. So I kind of sneakily sort of separated the US business from the other one and they bought that argument that it had to be separate and I wouldn't let them go anywhere near it so I had no idea how big it was, if it made money, if it didn't. I just said politically it's not the right time because I've got this customer relationship that's sensitive. Come back to me in 18 months' time. Right, so I've sold my Australian business to them. It's a matter of record uh, in the stock exchange announcement if you could dig it up. But it's a multiple of my revenue. Right. Uh, I wasn't able to find anything. Good. <laughs> but it's on, there was definitely a London stock exchange announcement because there had to be. Okay. Uh, it wasn't huge. Uh, but uh, certainly made my $5 million, if in case you're wondering. Yeah. Uh, so uh, six months later, I suddenly get a phone call from the global CEO out of London of this company. He says, we're ready to buy your business. I said, I'm not ready to sell it to you. It's not making you profit yet. He said, don't you worry about that. We have a strategic reason to buy it. Mm-hmm. And now I'm thinking, as soon as somebody says strategic reason, you start to rub your hands together and think, now how much can I squeeze out of these guys? Okay. So the global COO, who's a South African guy, and I was scared of him because South Africans are known to be very tight with money. Yeah. And that's not a, they're just good with business. He came to see me. He walked around the office. He Remember, he'd never been in my US office. He walked around, went into my office. We sat down, pulled out a piece of paper. In literally five minutes, we wrote down three numbers, shook hands, and the deal was done. Wow. And it was the same amount as I sold my Australian business for, effectively. Okay. So I just doubled my you know, return. Yeah. But to come back to your question was, as part of that deal, he said, oh, hang on, I forgot to keep you interested once I sell. Once you sell, you're not going to be interested anymore. I have to give you a bonus if you stay on for three years. Okay. So we negotiated the side deal, and that's called an earnout. Yeah. And how, for how many years was that? So that was three years. But earnouts, if you ever sell your business, one thing you have to remember is... It's like a marriage. Once the honeymoon's over, it's all downhill from there. Yeah. So the honeymoon happens when you sign the contract and the money changes hands on the original deal. After that, the company has got zero incentive to ever pay you the earn out. Yeah. It's always based on, the, on some profit figure that you have no control of and creative accounting can do amazing things for you against you. Right. So And also, you don't want to be there anymore yeah. because you've been used to running your own business, mm. having no boss, and suddenly you're part of some other corporation with bosses over you, and you probably mentally need retraining to do that. Yeah. So we were very, very happy to park company after 18 months. Yeah. And I made sure of that by playing as much online poker in my office and making sure my staff caught me doing it so the word would go back up the chain that maybe we don't need Adrian anymore. <laughs> So we negotiated a quick, a good exit. So if someone's still involved, <laughs> let's say a startup sells their company and they're going through their earnout, the goal then is to be playing po- online poker. Absolutely, play online poker because either you'll make money, and if you do, that's great. And if you don't, you lose a little bit and you'll get your earnout quicker because they want to get rid of you. Yeah, right. The only problem was well, my whole deal was cash. Okay. Because they offered me shares. And here's a simple negotiating line for you. If you're ever going to sell your business, the company acquiring you is going to want to offer you shares because it's easy for them. They just go to the stock exchange, they, they fill out some bits of paper, their company valuation dilutes slightly, and you get some bits of paper which may or may not be worth anything in the future. Mm. And I said, why would I trade risk in a company I know, which is my company, for risk in a company that I don't know, which is you. Mm. I mean, would I ever go in and, and put millions of dollars into shares in your company as my whole portfolio? 
never. Mm. So they paid me cash. But the negotiation on my earn out was I had to take that in shares. But it was fine. Yeah. Do you find many, are there many firms or or startups in Australia that go through the earn out process? Uh, Sure. Um, Mostly, a lot of them, most of them I'd say, most exits are probably aqua hires. Okay, yeah. And it depends then on whether the person doing the startup really does want a job or not. So if you get aqua hired into Facebook, you can probably be pretty comfortable with that. Mm. If I got aqua hired into Australia Post, I think I'd be pretty grumpy. Yeah. As much as it's a great organisation, but you're really entrepreneurial and Australia Post is not the most entrepreneurial organisation in the world, although it's trying to be, yeah. the culture is just too different. Yeah. So it's largely dependent on the company. I think so. I think yeah. it depends a lot. And it not only depends on the company. I find that working in a corporation, it really depends on your specific boss. And that can change because a company is overarching, but your relationship is with the three or four people around you. Yeah. And if you don't, you know, your whole, I think your whole working life is tempered by how good your relationship is with your immediate boss. Mm. So after short plan? So after short, look, I had, this, I, I had this idea that I wanted to be a venture capitalist. I had no idea what venture capital was. The first, I didn't have any funding in my business. I had no VC funding. I was debt-free. Aside from the funding line, I, ne- I negotiated for my finance company, which was completely debt, you know, full of debt, but that's money is our stock. So right. put that aside. In terms of ownership of the business, I had no partners, so I was a solo founder, mm-hmm. really hard, really hard journey. Yeah. But a big attraction of that is when you sell, you've got no one to split the money with. <laughs> so whatever you sell it for is all yours. Yeah. You've got one partner, you've, you've just halved your exit. You've got two partners, you just cut your exit in three. Yeah. That's, you know, that's a simple way of looking at it. So I had no partners. So I was not a very sophisticated investor by any stretch of the imagination. You've got a funny look on your face. Is the tea no good? No, the tea's okay. Okay. <laughs> Cheers. Uh, uh, Jordan's made me some uh, beautiful green tea, yeah, which I'm about some, to uh, taste. Yeah, some pearls. If I suddenly start spitting, you'll know it's really bad. No, it's just normally, you know, it, my problem is, right, is that I drink this out of a a proper clay pot. Ah. So when I drink it out of the clay pot, you've got this intense green tea flavour. Yeah, I think the glass doesn't retain the flavour. You know why? Because you probably don't wash your copper clay pot, so all that grime and filth and algae is actually adding value to the tea. Exactly, exactly. What's so, the, that's what the Chinese gentleman told me. He's like, never, ever wash the pot. That's what they say about woks too, but there are three, what, there's a billion of them, and they lose 200 million a year through bad health. And that's why. But the flavour is great. The flavour is unbelievable. The flavour is unbelievable. Shit you just see a walk at home. It's got bits of... Anyway, never mind. Don't come around for dinner. <laughs> so, uh, so to answer your question, I have got no idea what the question was. <laughs> so Angel Cube. Yeah, so what did I do after, uh, after selling the business? My first ever venture transaction was the one I negotiated to sell my business and turned into four separate contracts over a six-month period. So I learned a lot about negotiating venture deals. And then when I did stay for the company for 18 months, it was just before 2008, Mm -hmm. we did quite a few M&A transactions. And because I became senior vice president, North America of Auto, which, you know, really a title does not make any difference, you know, once you've had your own business. That is like a step down to be senior VP of anything. Yeah. It's like when you drive a Tesla, driving any other car like a Ferrari means absolutely nothing after that, <laughs> you know? That all goes out the window. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but, but I did want to be a venture capitalist. And what I did realize was I'm risk averse, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Even though I do stupid things all the time, I'm actually risk averse. So I buy remorse after I do it, I get nervous, but mm. I still do it anyway. But I wanted to be a VC, but I didn't want to lose too much money. So I partitioned in my mind that I could have half a million dollars to invest in startups or do something with it. And I thought what I really wanted to do was probably to launch 10 of my own internet businesses. Mm-hmm. $50,000 each would keep me to 500000 if I did 10 of those and lost them all rather than traditional businesses, you know, a million dollars in each, I'd lose five, $5 million. Okay, okay. Uh, so I did. So while I was living in the US, I found two partners and we launched, well, sorry, we built 
<laughs> very big difference between building and launching. We built two internet businesses, neither of which we launched. Okay. So one was a it's a combination of Facebook and eBay, I guess. Right. It was a genius idea. We built the whole thing. Yeah. And we built it in Ruby on Rails. Okay. All I know was I met the founder of David Hanson my at a racetrack in America. Da- by, David Heinemann Hanson. Yeah, yeah, that guy. Yeah. And he was a lovely, lovely guy. He had a yellow convertible Lamborghini. Right. And I was racing my car on another track. I was invited to a track day. I saw this yellow convertible uh, Lamborghini over there. And my son, who was 12 at the time, that was his favorite car. Okay. So being me, I walked over there. I said to the guy who hey. was just getting to racing jumpsuit, hi, my name is Adrian. You're driving my son's favorite car. And he said, who the fuck are you? No, he was much <laughs> more polite. The young Danish guy. Yeah. And I said, so what do you do? And he said, I do software. And I said, oh, okay, I do a bit of software. Do you do like shrink wrap software? I was thinking Microsoft Word. He says, no, and I sort of developed this little framework of a thing called Ruby on Rails. I said, you're David blah, 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 blah. I can remember his name in those days. And he was amazed that this fat old guy knew who he was. And we became friendly for a while. We would email each other. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've lost touch. Anyway, there you go. So that Ruby on Rails is always always in my head. Yeah. And I said to these two IT guys I found who were Java programmers, we're going to build this Facebook quasi thing and we're going to do it in Ruby on Rails. Okay. So they were working for uh, Sears Roebuck, building their online e-commerce platform, which is huge. Eddie Lambert, I think, was the guy, founder of, I mean, the CEO of, of uh, Sears. And they and they built this platform for me. And the only good thing that came out of it was they actually they loved it so much, this Ruby on Rails shit, that they left their job at Sears opened up their own consulting firm, and now they're going great guns. got like 30 or 40 staff, and they've never looked back. Yeah, That's right. thanks to my $50,000 loss. Yeah. And so I did a couple of those, came back to Australia, did a couple more. We never launched anything because okay. we didn't do any customer development. Yeah. Had no thought about how to market the shit. And I thought, this is not the right way to do it. I think I'll look for an mar- online marketing guy. And I Googled, and I found the guy, and that was actually Andrew Burt. Okay. And I didn't know him, and we just had coffee off Chapel Street. And I said, this is what I want to do. I want to launch a few more of these types of businesses. And he turned around to me and said, Google Y Combinator. We should do that. So I Googled Y Combinator, and we did that. Okay. And thus Angel Cube was born. Yeah. Now, how did you come to meet Nathan? Again, the same way. So Andrew and I were talking about how we would do Angel Cube, and we decided we needed two things. We needed a space to work mm-hmm. from, and he and Andrew said we need this thing called a co-working space. So I had to go Google that as well. Had no, idea. no, actually, it's not true. I knew what a co-working space was because I was going to open one up, but that was purely from a uh, making money on uh, on uh, real estate point of view. So I, yeah, I did know what a co-working space was. Uh, and we needed a CTO, somebody who's, who's got tech. So most people don't realise I did spend 10 years at IBM. I have got an IT degree. I have got a meteorology degree, and I can't code, and I can't forecast the weather. Yeah. <laughs> so I present I don't. So I needed somebody who really knew tech. Right. And we found this Virgin Airlines magazine that just featured... Uh, Inspire 9, and they did a thing called Night Owls. It was an overnight programming uh, hackathon, I guess. Right. And it was featured in the Virgin Airline magazine. We said we have to reach out to this guy. Yeah. And Inspire 9 was in a little terrace house, not much bigger than your apartment. We are in an apartment right now. This is not a professional <laughs> recording studio. And we're at Jordan's coffee table. <laughs> Although it, sound, it, should, it should sound like it. It's, look, the egg cartons on the wall are amazing. You nailed them all on. The landlord's going to hate you. <laughs> and uh, we went to see Nathan, and straight away, I'm in. Mm-hmm. So that was two pieces of the puzzle in place. The next piece was we needed some investors, and the reason for that was I didn't want to fund the whole thing myself because I thought then I, it, I would take ownership, and we wanted... Angel Cube to be community driven from day one. Mm-hmm. So it had to have a multitude of investors, a multitude of mentors, a multitude of startups. Everything had to be many to many to many for the programmers out there. Mm-hmm. So again, we found these two guys, we read about them who just exited their little business called Retail Me Not. That was Guy uh, King yeah. and Bevan Clark. Yeah. And we literally cold call on them. Mm-hmm. And straight away, got, we sat at a table like this at their office in Little Collins Street. 
Uh, they just sold the business. I think they just sold the business. They had just sold the business. And Guy King straight away said, you can use my name. I'm in. Mm-hmm. Whatever way you want. And then over a series of couple of conversations, we, uh, they became our cornerstone investors. I put some money in. They put some money in. And then I went to market and we got five or ten other investors. And over a couple of years, we put together a one and a half million dollar fund and angel cube was was born was throwing money away left right and center and how long ago now was that 2011 we did our first cohort so this was what was really interesting in that time a couple of things that happened so we learned i feel as now i came i came in as a total outsider to the startup scene okay you think about it, i had a business and then i had two or three little startups i tried to launch on my own yeah and then i came into and looked around for this scene i had really struggled to find people. There were no events I could find. There were no hackathons I could find. We did it. And as I said, Inspire 9 was a little terrace house. And after five years of knowing Nathan, I just found out that Inspire 9 means there were nine people. So I must have been an Inspire 10, I think. Wow. (laughs) And so a couple of things happened in parallel. So in 2011, when we started Angel Cube, Nathan... Took move to uh, um, Stewart Street, Richmond, mm-hmm. which was the current Inspire Nine space, and took half the floor there, and it, nine, ten people in there. It looked empty, and I thought, poor Nathan's going to lose his money. This place is never going to fill up. Within six months, it was full. Wow! And within a year, he had to take the other half. Okay. And then the next year, as soon as he filled it up, he took another floor. Yeah. He filled it up. And now he's got two other floors at the Dream Factory. So the Inspire 9 space has literally doubled in size every year for the last five years. That's Mm. exponential growth for a physical space. It's pretty remarkable. I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but generally to see the startup scene, whether in Melbourne or Sydney, the amount of growth that's happened. You know, you've got to think even a couple of years ago, the amount of events, if I look at those meetup events, the amount of events we're on, they're so niche now you just have a like as as an example you have one event just purely about bots and that's it yeah and look there's like 30 or 40 co-working spaces in melbourne alone now this is you know crazy good growth Mm. so here's where we were now wind back to 2011 we've got this idea we're going to do a y combinator style you know fun thing in australia we're going to do we think we're going to do four startups to try it Mm-hmm. And we think there aren't four startups in Melbourne. If there are, they won't give a shit about us and we'll struggle to find them. So we put one press release out. We wrote it ourselves. We didn't have a PR agent. And we sent it. This is how naive we are. We sent it to two people. We sent it to BRW, I think it was. And we sent... No, I think we just sent it to one person. We sent it to Fin Review. They did a full-page article on us. Wow. Angel Cube launches in Melbourne. Wow. And then I think BRW just lifted that article and copied it. Yeah. And it went out through all the startup. Well, there was, I think, Startup Smart or Smart Company was already just going. Yeah. And it was everywhere. We got 150 applications. It blew me away. Wow. So, in the ver- so that's the latent demand in Melbourne yeah. for that narrow period of time that we're open for applications. There are 150 people looking for a space and accelerator. Yeah. So we went through that process and found our four startups. So the next year we thought, okay, we'll do 10 startups. Mm-hmm. We'll do, do, do between five and 10. And we ended up doing six or seven. We got 100 new applications. And the next year, we got 100 new applications. Wow. So in Melbourne, every year, we've had between 80 and 100 with very little overlap from the year before. Yeah. There were a lot of people in Melbourne. And we didn't just get Melbourne. We got Canberra. We even got overseas teams. Did you get many teams from Sydney? Because I know you had that uh, you had that pitch that if someone brought their startup down from Sydney, you'd fund them. Oh, yeah, you remember that? <laughs> yeah. That's still open, by the way. Yeah, I'm still that 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 offer has no expiry date on it. <laughs> it was free. I think it was basically for two percent equity. I was going to give them ten thousand dollars. That's right. Uh, to do that, that's still available still to any there. startup that wants to relocate to Melbourne. Okay. I mean. It, it, and really think about how you can game that system. I'm planning on coming to Melbourne anyway. I'll just tell Adrian I'm going to do it if he pays me the 10K. That's free money, man. Yeah. Well, not really free yet to give me 2%. Okay. <laughs> and I'll become your mentor and advisor. <laughs> not a bad trade. Yeah. Well, who knows? <laughs> maybe, I have to, maybe I have to pay them 20 to get them to do that. Yeah. So you spend most of your time now on AngelCube? No. So after five, 
Look, the thing, thing is, I basically retired when I was 49. Mm-hmm. So I didn't work for two years in, the U, in, in my last two years in the USA. And I came back to Australia and didn't really work or do anything for the first two or three years when I got back, even though I started my finance company, either run by itself while I was away, little five-man business, and they kept running by itself. So I, that's my trouble with my businesses. I don't pay them much attention once they're running. Yeah. I like to build new things. Uh, so I really wasn't doing much. So I came out of retirement to do Angel Cube, and I thought, you know, I'll just come in and help out, raise a little bit of money. It became pretty close to full-time you know, labor of love mm. because when you're an entrepreneur, there's no such thing as half doing anything. You're either all in or you're oh, all out. No. And I was all in. And after five years, uh, there were other accelerators. There were other options. There were all those hackathons. I thought, do I really need to be doing this full time now that the ecosystem is pumping? Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying I had anything to do with it, but we certainly had a part in it. Uh, so I thought, and Nathan felt the same way. He wanted to spend the year in San Francisco. So we didn't run Angel Cube last year and nobody's crying. Yeah. Do you think that's... Uh, I feel like there's a few things that I've picked up from Shoreplan and, and this is you spoke about being risk averse. It seems that you sort of start to realise when things are a bit much that you pull back. Do you think that's a part of it at all? No, no, I, I don't think it's... Like, do you ever go look at the Melbourne startup scene and say things are a bit frothy at all or anything like that and go... I mean, look, as you say, I am a pessimist. I, you know, I'm always think the next, uh, the next, the bubble is here right now, and the next crash is going around the corner. So I might miss opportunities that I should have invested in. But I continue to invest in tech startups. I continue. I just made a hundred k investment in a startup last week. So I put a tweet out on, on I guess Wednesday last week saying that I would never invest in uncapped convertible notes. Mm-hmm. And within and yeah. 24 hours, I invested in uncapped convertible notes. That's the entrepreneurial that. side of me. Yeah. The risk-averse side of me would say, Adrian, you can't keep doing that. Yeah. You know, you, you can project that forward five years and I'll be sitting on the street corner with a tin cup in my hand begging for money. Yeah. On the other hand, if I was Elon Musk, I wouldn't care. I would just keep doing it. Just, so that's, yeah. that's the yin and yang balance. Yeah, it's always a balance. That, that mental dialogue, I guess, of yeah. what should I be doing. And remember, I mean, my risk-averse side says I went out and moved the family to the USA. You can't get much more, you know, out on the limb than doing that mm. and finding an opportunity. But the second I did it, I looked for an acquirer. Yeah. Because I feel any deal you can get is a deal you can lose. Yeah. So I always look for the uh, safety net. Okay. While we're on the point of, of moving the family over, your son, he's done... It seems I don't know. You always uh, praise your son when when <laughs> which when father we, doesn't? <laughs> yeah, when you when we first spoke about um, when we first met, I remember you you said so, it was something along the lines of, "Don't worry about what I'm doing. You should see what Adam's doing." Um, but he so he runs a small business called Speedlancer. If, yes. I'm, if I'm not right, uh, not wrong uh, there. Now, do you think that you've instilled anything in him? In particular, like any lessons about being an entrepreneur in particular that you've learned over the years? Or do you sort of sit back and just watch? I try and sit back and watch. Right. Uh, I don't want to be the soccer father. You know, the the guy that that loved soccer, was never very good at school but wanted to be better, sees their son might have a little bit of talent and pushes them to go to the soccer matches and really pushes them to try hard. And the son or daughter doesn't want to play soccer. They just want to go and pull a cello out and play music. Yeah. I never wanted to be that father. That was really, really important to me. Uh, the second thing is that Adam started his entrepreneurial journey much, much younger than me. Mm. I remember when he was like five or six years old, he made a little sign because he knew his grandmother made cakes and wanted to put it outside the house to sell cakes. <laughs> and she would make the cakes and he would sell them outside the house. He never went through with the idea. I guess his customer development wasn't good, but he made the yeah. sign. Okay. But we were living in America, and when he was 12, he came to... I remember this conversation clearly. He came to me and said, Dad, can I have $50? Now, Adam is not the sort of guy that asks for anything. Mm-hmm. So I said, sure, here's $50. And I thought I was handing it to him. What 12-year-old asks for $50? Why do you want it? And he says, I'm starting an eBay business, and I'm going to give you 49%. Right. Now, 
I thought that was pretty smart of him. And then I realised, and this took me many years to actually think about this, my joint venture with my with lease plan in the USA, that's who I eventually did a joint venture with, was a 51%, 49% joint venture. I had 51%, they had 49%. Uh. I must have mentioned it in passing or discussed it with my wife, Sharon, and he must have heard that why I did a 51 and that stuck in his mind. So mm. I guess there are lessons you impart the, without even thinking about it. There definitely is, and it probably brings me to my next question, but I know I had the same thing with my father because he he's an entrepreneur himself, but you sort of, you would see as a child, you'd see things that you, your parents would do and you would sort of want to copy it or, you know, replicate it in some way. So maybe there's stuff there. Maybe like, you know, the fact that he's going out on his own, he's learned that from his dad to just take a punt, so I to speak. I think he's seen it and that yeah. helps. He's definitely got the genes, otherwise he wouldn't have started so early. Uh, so I think it's that combination of genes and conditioning but I, I feel that the way to bring up your children is to be there as a quiet backstop if they get into too much trouble, mm-hmm. but you can't ever tell them that you're there for that. Yeah. And, but most importantly is that you're there to answer questions, and that's been my whole view. Okay. If Adam comes and asks me a business question, it's got to come from him. I'll answer the question, and hopefully I don't embellish too much. Yeah. And that's how I've tried to do it. And unfortunately, he does come and talk to me about businessy stuff but he doesn't tend to tell us how much money he's making how much money he's got uh, in the bank we picked that up by osmosis a little bit here or there uh, so we're just as much we got no idea how successful this startup <laughs> really is but he has closed the funding round so i don't know that he's announced it yet okay but he went through 500 startups last year he moved to san francisco for six months mm-hmm. i think it was in batch 12 yeah and then 12 months he, he came back to australia had some visa issues he he's got he's stuck with his visa he can't get back in america right now right okay uh, if anyone's trying to get a visa to go to the u.s have a chat with Adam about, you know, the right and wrong way to go about doing it. Yeah. So now he's got his degree, I think he'll get a visa back. Okay. Uh, but he just closed the funding round from small, led by Small Sydney Boutique Fund okay. and some private investors. Interesting. And I followed on and put a couple of bucks in at the end of that. Yeah. Well, I'm interested to see what happens because, yeah, it looks like a very, very good business. Yeah, if, for well. those out there, you should definitely check it out. Speedlancer.com. Yeah, Speedlancer HQ on Twitter. You know, Twitter, I used I Speedlancer last night. I had a board meeting with my partners in my... I just merged my finance company earlier this year, which is why it's been a big change of life for, you, for me. I now have two partners in my finance company, which is my remaining business, and we had a board meeting, and they emailed me a PDF of a debtors list, and debtors are very important to our business. And it wasn't easy for me to... At all. I could spend an hour retyping the numbers into a spreadsheet, not good use of my time, so I went on Speedlancer, I selected a PDF to Excel transcription job, $39. I could have made it 29 or 15 if I wanted. Mm. Uh, but $39 I put up, and in the morning, because I did it before I went to bed, it was transcribed in the spreadsheet for me. Wow. For 39 bucks, I had like zero effort. It was great. Yeah. Yeah, I th- I, my opinion is that you should always be trained. If, if you value your time wisely, those sorts of things should always be abstracted away or outsourced. Your time is your mo- is your only valuable resource. So valuable. Yeah. Now, the the last point I want to touch on family is: Do you think there's any lessons that you've learnt from your parents, whether directly or indirectly, over the years, like uh, that you now replicate in your life? Like, for example, with my parents, I know that, and I was saying this on the last podcast. With my father, it was indirectly hard work, just purely from the sheer amount of hours that he used to do through his business. Do you think then that there's anything that you've learnt indirectly or directly, maybe they've told you from one of your parents that you now carry with you? I think that most of the lessons are exactly that, by watching and by osmosis, because both sides of my family are immigrants. I'm first-generation Aussie. Mm-hmm. Uh, my um, my mother's my yeah my maternal grandparents came from Poland, Holocaust survivors, mm-hmm. uh, both Polish. And my paternal grandparents were Romanian. Well, actually, one was Romanian and one was uh, one was uh, Austrian. But my father was Romanian, my mother Polish. So all Holocaust survivors arriving mm. variously in the early fifties, late forties. Okay. Uh, and you watch these people. Like, take my grandmother, my grandmother and my grandfather on my mother's side, who probably most of my influence 
comes from because my other grandparents died when I was young. Most of my influence comes from that side. They were wealthy in Poland, so they had a they owned a bank and a movie theatre and an apartment with staff. Wow. So they had, you know, cooks, cleaners, like four or five staff in this small town in Poland. But they were wealthy people. I mean, my grandmother once told me a story <laughs> in a little old way that every time a new movie came to town, the very first showing wouldn't start unless my grandmother and grandfather, as owners of the theatre, were there. Right. And she said with a little titter, we were otherwise indisposed one afternoon and we forgot about the movie. And there's a driver sent to our door, knocked on the door, and I can only imagine what they were indisposed doing, she said with a little titter. They were probably in bed. <laughs> little grandparents in bed, what a horrible <laughs> thought. And uh, they had to get dressed quickly to go to the theatre so the movie could start. So that's where they came from. Okay. And my grandmother never had to work a day in her life. Then they fast forward, they, obviously the Nazis take everything, they're very lucky to, to be survive, alive. Yeah. Comple- I mean, if you read my grandmother's memoirs, it's like miracle after miracle after miracle. She is a hard, she was a hard ass woman. Mm. She only died uh, three years ago. She wow. made it to a hundred. Wow! Because she wanted the letter from the queen. Once she got the letter from the queen, she stopped eating and she died twelve days later. Wow! Yeah, this is one hard ass woman. <laughs> So you can imagine what you learn from that. But loving, 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 loving. Yeah, yeah. I could do no wrong. I'm a genius. I'm a smart guy. Eat your chicken soup. You're brilliant. Here's a sandwich, you know. Yeah. Uh, so you learn a lot from that. Yeah. And, I, and one hard lesson, one impo- like simple lesson I learned, my grandmother said to me that when they were re-struggling to set up in Australia, they lived in a crappy old flat. I remember that in New Street, uh, New Street, Brighton, somewhere around there. Or in Elwood, they lived in a little flat. We were born, uh, I was living in New Street. No way. Right. I, I, I grew up around the corner from there. Oh, well, yeah, your parents probably knew my, my parents. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they lived in this crappy flat that they, that they rented. You've got to remember where they came from. And uh, she wanted to buy a house. They started a little, a little business and were starting to, to grow and be successful. So they were just small business people, I'm sure, like your parents. Mm. And she wanted to buy a house. And my grandfather said, you know what? Lola was her name. We can always buy a house from our business. But if we buy a house now, we may not have a successful business. Right. And I, that lesson really stuck wow. in my life. And I've always invested that's outside first before investing in the luxuries. Yeah. That's such a measured response. Hmm. That's really interesting. And, but the important thing was that she went for it. Yeah. And my grand, when my grandfather died, and he died when I was like 20-something, uh, my grandmother had never been near the business. I mean, he sold out of the business already. Never touched the family finances. He did it all. And I thought, you know, she's not capable of doing all that, any of that sort of stuff. She was just, you know, she'd never worked a day. Well, she had worked in the business, but never to do the business side. As soon as he died, she just went out there and she picked up all the family finances and made it all work. I mean, very capable woman. Wow. Now, what area, just out of interest, what area of Poland did they come from? Because my girlfriend's family's, uh, well, her, her grandfather was Polish. Okay. Yeah. He, they weren't Jewish, but they were part of, part of the Polish, you know, aristocracy, military, and they lost everything, obviously. Really? Uh, oh. Absolutely everything. Yeah. He, it's actually quite a fascinating story. Like he spoke something like six languages, was in the Polish army, then joined the British um, intelligence during the war, yes. fought in Italy, um, went back to Poland, then married a German uh, nurse, and then they moved out to a to Australia in 1950 because they were looked down upon because you know a Pole couldn't marry a German and vice versa. Was he part of like Anders' army in in Britain? So there was a whole. I don't, we don't know en- enough. Unfortunately, neither my girlfriend or her parents asked enough questions. And I, I didn't meet him because he'd passed away a year or two before I started dating her. Because my wife's uh, father came also Polish. Mm. Uh, my wife's parent family's all Polish, mm-hmm. same, similar background. And her father was, uh, was in the war in Poland. He escaped and when the war started at some stage... And a whole lot of Polish officers and soldiers went to the UK. And there's a, a, there was a, a regiment called Anders Army, which is all made up of Polish right. people now joined the British Army. And they were sent to Fort, like he was at 
the D Day, and and if you ask him what he did, he said he peeled potatoes. I got no idea what he did. Yeah, but we, uh, my wife, managed to write to the British Army and get his military. Records. Service record, so you know he was a, a sapper, an engineer of some sort. It may be that you that you can find out about your they, side. They've got a, they've got a bit of documentation. It's quite frightening actually looking at some of it. Like for example, with her um, grandmother who was German, and looking at like they have documents of you know her high school years and education, and like seeing that. Um, you know, like the Nazi symbolism on everything. Yeah. It's quite amazing. It's scary And it's stuff. it's really scary, like, because you look at it and it's so powerful and demeaning and it's like, it's it's very imposing. And, and all, you would see certain things that, like, I don't think she really believed in any of that stuff. They were, she, she married a Pole, like, yeah. so she was very anti what happened, obviously, but she was still... You know, they they indoctrinated people, didn't they? Completely. An entire generation. Yeah. So she would say things about people who were black or, you know, maybe um, just little offhand stuff that you thought, wow, and she's had that as a child growing up and just sort of normalised it. And I think we're starting to see some little signs of that sort of thing happening yes. in the world again. We've got this move to divide, you know, divide... Uh, left and right again yes and it's worrying it's scary do you do you happen to listen to joe rogan or any of these you know generalist podcasts at all it's it's very interesting i mean his take and a lot of people's take on it is because the left had pushed so far you know with having safe places social justice warriors all that and the like that a lot of people, particularly in um, the baby boomer generation, are pushing back because they're sick of being told they're racist, they're sexist, all this sort of stuff, when they're generally not. It's only a fringe percentage that are. Correct. And look, uh, you know, Nazism arose and fascism arose through the war because uh, people were economically in trouble. Mm. And people, yep. make, do, people do stupid things when they can't eat at home. Yeah. And that's what causes the rise, and now it it's, it's comes out of fear. Honestly, you can you saw that in Brexit. Yes. And you, you see it now. You, I mean, people always go on about um, the middle class in America, but you just see it in the states that primarily swung for Trump. They're all Rust Belt states. They've all been decimated by the GFC, and a lot of people forget yeah. about that. Well, I think when Florida swung to Trump, which was the state that he couldn't possibly win, but he had to win... Uh, that's scary. And also the interesting thing is if you look at the exit polls, and I don't understand the stats well enough, even though I lived in the USA, it was, it was only the people in the centre of the big cities. And you have to realise when you talk about Chicago, mm. you don't mean like what we talk about when we say Melbourne, which includes Melton to, uh, to Frankston is Melbourne. When they say Chicago, they mean like the city of the downtown plus the fringe suburbs. Like if it was Melbourne, it would be the city of Melbourne, including Richmond. Yeah, and inner city. Well, that's all they mean. Yeah. Those people voted very clearly for Hillary. Mm. Everybody in the suburbs out voted for Trump yeah. almost across the board. Exactly. But that sort of just tells you, doesn't it, how we sort of live in... I mean, I feel like a lot of people just live in these echo chambers now. Mm. You know, like they... they s they're friends with their friends who also live in similar areas and come from similar socioeconomic statuses and have same beliefs. So therefore, they only see the problems they see. You know, and particularly if you're voting for Hillary and, and whatnot, you come generally, you could assume that you've got quite a high level of education. You see a lot of what you call first world problems, you know, social issues and whatnot. Yeah. Whereas a lot of other people who would vote for Trump, they see a lot of just simple core problems like safety and economics uh, we're, we're, we're tribal so for example my mm. facebook feed and I, look my kids will tell you i've got no idea how social media really works <laughs> just follow my twitter post to know oh, you're pretty good they have got no idea but like on facebook i still only try and friend people who i know are friends mm -hmm. which is not how it works anymore facebook is just friend everybody and who cares but on facebook i'm tribal you'll see i'm sharing a lot of jewish centric pro-Israel posts mm. because that's my cultural background and all my friends are sharing them I'm clicking like and resharing them all over the place on Twitter I'll do mainly startup-y stuff mm -hmm. and I'll start to do a little bit of personal finance stuff because that's my other passion and once in a while I'll put up a you know a, a pro, you know what I consider to be a pro-Israel 
represents my point of view and what I think is in the world. Mm. Of course, nobody ever comments on it, but I slot in there every once in a while. Yes. That's part of who I am. I was going to ask you that. Yeah, I've, I was looking at those and I'm, I was always intrigued to see what the response is. Yeah, And not nothing. one comment or no. reply or anything because no. they don't want to – they. They don't want to open a can of worms. Yeah, and I put the three brackets around my uh, around my name, which is a sign of solidarity of anti Nazism. Mm-hmm. Uh, nobody ever comments on that, but I don't expect them to. Well, I did. I asked. I remember I asked you. You did <laughs> ask me about that, correct? Well, I, I had to read intrigued. about. It. I saw it once. Yeah, and I thought, what the hell is this? It was very hard. There were two articles about it, and the articles were actually so badly written. And this is a problem, and this is a a real issue. There's so much intellectualism. In the opinion, in the opinion-oriented press, particularly in the USA, so like the New Yorker, which does essays, so much highbrow intellectualism. I struggle to understand it. Mm. How is the average person on the average street going to understand what somebody's actually trying to say? Yeah, we've got to dumb, not dumb it down. We've got to, we've got to moderate things and bring it to the average person, not uh, aim everything that we write about at the top at the most intellectual part of our countries. And this is exactly the same problem that arose in Germany. Germany during the 1930s and 1920s was an intellectual society and therefore more and more people became disenfranchised because they didn't get what was going on, what was being spoken about. Mm. You had too much difference between the rich and the poor and the highly educated and the not so highly educated. Yeah, We've got to be inclusive. We've yeah. got to... I, Speak I, for the average person. A hundred percent agree. I find it weird when people like someone. Actually, one of my friends raises with me like, "Why are you following following Milo Yiannopoulos uh, or Breitbart?" You know, this is the alt right news that they have in the US. And the thing is, you need to understand the other side's position. Completely. Otherwise, how could you rationalize with them ever? And um, it's actually interesting you mentioned that about um, uh, bringing people together. Like I know, do you know? Uh, Yuval Noah Harari. Yes. Uh, the You know, the book Sapiens. Of course. Po- possibly one of the best books I've ever read. I would put it down as probably the best book I've read. Now, he's general... I read this article through the BBC uh, a couple, couple months ago, and it was just talking about how people looking at um, uh, life from a perspective of humanism versus dataism, which is what he's calling it. But primarily, people are too often using their human experience versus actual fact to rationalize a position or explain a position, particularly within media. So I found that very, very interesting, and I wonder if maybe it's just that the the game of media and journalism needs to change. The way that we communicate, I find... Um, I mean, you could see it through the election. There's so much hyperbole. It was ridiculous. I was actually angry about the election, about the media, and I didn't voice this. I found one article that I retweeted mm. on uh, on Twitter about that uh, because I just felt that the media was completely biased against Trump and towards Hillary. Mm. And all I could say is that Hillary is not wasn't as good as people say. No. Trump is not as bad as they say. Yeah. You can put Hillary on the better side as a person, Trump on the worst side, because of things he's said and things he's done. Mm. But my point is it's about degrees. Yes. And the media loves to put, stretch the boundaries because at the end of the day, maybe it sells newspapers. I'm sure that's what it's about. But media has become opinion pieces, not journalistic reporting anymore. And what I want is I want journalistic reporting because I think I'm smart enough to make up my own mind. Mm. And that's what got me angry. It's not that they said Trump was bad and that Hillary was good. I know they're all human beings and they're all, you know, they've got their foibles Mm -hmm. and the media just didn't report it in, I thought, a balanced way. Yeah. And people should have, and that reacted badly because I think people made the wrong decision and voted for Trump. Yeah. I mean, we're shocked. Yeah. Who wants Trump as a president and who wants Brexit? Mm. We're shocked and we're going to see more of this. Yeah. I I, th- I, could, I wouldn't be surprised if something like this was to, not to happen in Australia, but the pe- people like Pauline Hanson gaining more of a power in, I, th- I, I mean, you just speak to people, I mean, go speak to my, my parents. The world that they live in is totally different to the world that I live in and that they see and you need to be able to communicate that better. Um, well, the day when Pauline Hanson is regarded as legitimate is oh, the day man. this country is over. Yeah. You remember she when she first uh, did her, her, her backbench speech and 
And she was thankfully largely laughed at, and now she's being completely legitimized. That is already a huge shift towards the right. Mm. And and for me, everything in life is about balance. Mm. There's always yin and yang. It's always black. You know, there's no black and white. It's always grey. The the right position is always the middle position Mm. in, in general. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. I think we were speaking about it before when it comes to politics. Neither of us really swings one particular... I mean, you know, economics makes sense. Um, but sometimes there's a lot of things that politicians do that don't make sense. Yeah. Um, anyway, I want to perhaps swing us in the direction of startup specific now. Um, but I want to start with a question that came from someone It was about Tesla. <laughs> Now, you just bought a Tesla. A year ago. Had yeah. its first service. Yeah. Now, we, I remember one of the few meetings that we've had was briefly in a Tesla. So, um, when it was uh, Matt, wasn't it? Yes. P- picked us up. We went Correct. for a ride in the Tesla. Yeah. And that was down on Swan Street, Richmond. Yeah, that's right. And what got me was that we were doing 40Ks an hour, because that's the speed limit, but the thing just instantly moved from stop to go there was no yeah. lag even at 40k you could feel the difference in that to a normal car yeah it's quite amazing now what model do you drive uh all right so here was my thinking i didn't pay tesla a lot of attention surprisingly enough i'm sort of a tech guy but but i love to buy commercially available tech that works so when they announced the Roadster, which was their first car, which is based on the Lotus with the batteries, I looked at it and I thought, that sounds interesting, but I never really followed it. Yeah. And then when the Model S was announced, I thought, that's interesting, but didn't really follow it. And then when they started talking about bringing it out to Australia, now I started to think about it. I thought, you know, I bought an M3 BMW, the eight-cylinder one, when it just came out. It's a phenomenal car. You know, it's eight cylinder. It was at its time amazing, and I spent a lot of money on that car, mm-hmm. and they depreciate like crazy. crazy yeah. So I thought, you know what? If this Tesla is, you know, two hundred thousand dollars or whatever, I'm not going to buy it. But if it's ninety thousand Australian, I think that'll be about right. I'll, I'll I'll buy it. And Elon Musk did something I thought was very good. He said we're going to sell it around the world at exactly the same as U.S. pricing plus conversion rate to the local currency, plus just local taxes. That's Mm -hmm. the only difference. So we're not going to have different pricing for different countries. Which if you know about the price... Okay, so in America, I bought a two-seater Maserati convertible, which was six months old in 2006. And I had that car until I left America two years later. And it's the saddest thing I ever left behind. Mm -hmm. Tears of the eye. And I paid $93,000 for that, wow. US. That same car in Australia would probably be a quarter of a million dollars. Yeah. Because they just rip us off. Mm. Okay? Part of it's taxes, but most of it's just the, the dealers are putting in a high, you know, they, they, they're paying what the market will bear. Well, isn't it not the scarcity of the, the resource? Maybe that, but in America it should be the same thing, right? Yeah. So we have a huge price imparity non-parity in cars it's a massive difference u.s car price cars to australian same car in australia so i thought if elon does that i think it'll be about ninety thousand australian was my guess they announced it for 90k i'll buy it and wacko the announcement comes ninety thousand dollars australia so i click straight it's all order on the website yeah right? it's yeah. like ordering phones so i click straight on the website of course it's ninety thousand for the base model with options yeah. So I click on all the options, click, 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 click. So I want all the options. And there's now a 200000 plus dollar car. And I think, oh, shit. I better unclick the zero, the cold weather pack, because it doesn't get so cold in Australia. Do I really need rear seat heating? And that took $600 off the price. And I thought, what an idiot am I? I'm going to buy this $200,000 car and I'm going to save 600 bucks. I clicked it back on. So I bought every single option. Okay. So it was top of the line. And then, and <laughs> this is how I, that's an impulse uh, purchase of, of $100,000, yeah. just so you know. Yeah. Uh, then I waited a year for that. And just as I was about to get 
like my car was just about to be manufactured. It was within three months of delivery after waiting for a year. And Matt's already had his yeah. car, so I was so jealous of him. Uh, they suddenly came out with an upgrade to what they call the D model, which puts an extra engine on the front. And yeah. I read the performance stats. Now, you've got to realise I bought an M3. I had a Maserati in America. I bought the same Maserati, by the way, in Australia. That's my, 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 my spare car. Uh, I like performance. Yeah. So when I read the performance stats on this thing, I immediately called them up and said, can I upgrade? They said, sure. And go click the upgrade option. So now I've got, a, so now I've got you know, the top of the line of that. And it took me another year before it arrived. Okay. So it cost me two years. So it came effectively last September. Yeah. And then they announced the ludicrous upgrade. So the way this performance works is that Elon Musk saw a movie called Spaceballs, which is Mel Brooks. Yeah. And when they're going faster through space, instead of going Warp Factor 5, Scotty, like in Star Trek, they go, we've got to go faster, put into insane mode. So it goes insane. And that's what my car came with, insane mode with the two engines. Right. And then the next speed upgrade up there is put in ludicrous mode. Yeah. And so that's what I got. And the next one coming out is maximum plaid. Wow. Maximum plaid. So I'm waiting for that. I've seen the stats on that. The, uh, it's now what? It's now the fastest car that you can buy. Uh, one of the fastest cars with that well, 2.4 seconds to, is it 60 kilometers or miles? Uh, six, well, 60, mile, to 60 miles an hour is just under uh, three seconds for my car. And what I found out is that now I thought mine was going to be the last upgrade. Uh, but they've come out with a new design battery pack, and the new cars coming out can actually go faster than mine. There's no upgrade path from mine wow. to the new one. So the new ones go 2.5 seconds, roughly. Right. It's the fastest production car on the planet. Now, what is it that so intrigues you about, the f- say, electric vehicles and the potential future that they have? Like, specifically Tesla, because Tesla, I know you're a, you're a big fanboy of Tesla. I've noticed that through your tweets. Every now and then, there's something that comes out that you're tweeting about. Yeah, so again, coming back to it, I wasn't an electric guy to begin with until I got my car. And it's like, I think, getting the iPhone, original iPhone, uh, which is now almost 10 years old. When it was announced, it looked amazing. But when you put it in your hands, you could never imagine going back to a BlackBerry. I mean, no one can. That's why BlackBerry is basically broke. Uh, It's that paradigm changing, and you won't understand us. You're actually in one and you drive it. Mm. Uh, it is a totally different way of driving a car. Mm. So, for example, in a normal car, you're pressing the accelerator and then you're pressing the brake to stop. In my car, you're just pressing the accelerator. It uses such strong battery regeneration. So when you take your foot off the accelerator, it's recharging the battery through friction. You rarely have to touch the brakes. Right. So a car that's a year old has got maybe one millimetre of wear on their brake pads. And this is a two and a half ton car. Yeah. It's a ton heavier than a normal car. It is a complete paradigm changing car. Off the traffic lights, the, what you want to do is have a Ferrari next to you. You want to look at your guy, just arch one eyebrow up and wait for him to take off and then just put your foot down and he will throw his car away. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen some of the drag races and I, I yeah, the... For me, they're incredibly impressive. Incredibly impressive. For me, it's the driving experience, and the electric is very environmental, unfortunately, is very secondary. And there's a logical reason for that, because in Australia, the way the, uh, the, way the certificates work from the government, the incentives for green power are all at the provider level. Right. So, like, your lawn power station has to produce 80% of their power dirty, 20% clean whether you, whether you use it or not. So whether you've got you know a green car or or whether you've got solar cells in your roof or not actually doesn't change anything in the short term. In the long term, of course, it sways public opinion. Okay. So when the new Tesla solar roof comes out, yeah, uh, we're going to replace the roof of the house yeah. for sure. Put the battery packs in; will be 100% solar. Right now, I'm buying momentum, you know, water power from Tasmania. Okay. But that's only just to assuage my guilt. It actually doesn't do anything. Yeah, it probably doesn't. It doesn't in Australia. <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, it doesn't in Australia, unfortunately. Now, what, what do you see in terms of startup opportunities? I mean, my, and opportunities generally for maybe electric vehicles and broadening that to autonomous cars. I mean, I know that um, I wrote an article about what I see happening there. I think that largely it will 
in my opinion, change society significantly. Like, if you think that if a manufacturer could either make a car to sell to you at a premium or put a whole bunch of cars at scale onto the road as a fleet and they make 50000 from selling the car but 90000 on the life of the car through the fleet, it's really going to change the way that we view transport, the way that we view... I mean, if you imagine that you had readily available transport as a service, just a car comes up autonomously, what, how does that change where we live, you know? It's going to... Look, we said that about the Segway too, but the Segway didn't sell, unfortunately. So, <laughs> so it all depends on the takeoff. But I think the yeah. parallel... And I've looked a lot at this as well, obviously. I've got, a, I've got an interest. Self-driving interests me far more than pure electric. So... Until, you know, the green thing changes and then the laws change. But, uh, but that's what interests me. And, and I think there's a lot of parallels. And I, uh, I tweeted uh, a chart about that. You can see people think this is going to be gradual. No. This is going to reach a tipping point and it's going to sneak up on you and, and, and change. Boom. Again, I'll say it like phone evolution was gradual until the iPhone came out. Mm-hmm. And then it was a step change and boom. Bang. And then gradual, of course, iteration on that until whatever the next change is. So like Brian Rommel, who tweets and writes a, a lot, says it's going to be voice first. And I can imagine that, you know, when the new Apple AirPods come out, yes. we'll have those things in our ear and we'll be talking to our computers 90% of the time. And then the phone in our pocket will only be there if there's something major. Mm. And it'll be the same with cars. But the transition from horses to cars happens gradually until the manufacturing change of Ford came in mm. and made cars affordable. And then it was boom. It wasn't – it changed in six years. Like a, ho- like a hockey puck. It was a yeah, hockey puck. Cool. If you look at the graph long term, it looks more linear. But if you expand the year t- 1923 to 1933, some of that range, is a very clear, huge exponential curve mm. when it tips. And that caused a lot of changes because the roads became paved. Right. Horse and carts didn't need paved roads. Yeah. Uh, they had to widen the roads. Do you know that, that pedestrian crossings only came in as a result of an advertisement, advertising campaign by General Motors, and the term jaywalking came in? Have you heard the term jaywalking? Yeah, yeah. So jaywalking means that if you cross the road except where it's designated, except at the pedestrian crossing, except the traffic lights as a pedestrian, you are jaywalking. And jay, it means an idiot. Right. Okay, that's what the term jay means. Yeah. So General Motors put out an advertising campaign to basically say, if you drink and drive, you're a bloody idiot. Well, they said, if you cross the road at the wrong point, you're an idiot. Right. And what they did that for was to clear the roads of pedestrians so cars can barrel along and fulfill their true potential. Yeah. Those sort of changes are going to come and happen and we won't be able to predict them and they will be surprising and they will be quick. Yeah. Within five years, your next car well, will yeah. be electric. Well, Bloomberg New Energy Finance says 2020. I mean, you can see it with the ramp up in production from BMW, Volkswagen, I mean, obviously Tesla, General Motors, Ford, they're all going to have large-scale electric vehicles, like vehicles that can go over 250 to 300 kilometers, right? Yes. Um, with an, a potent, some of them with the potential to be slightly autonomous. Do you know that there was a modified Tesla vehicle, uh, which somebody from the, which the transport minister in Victoria said, we have to look at the laws because there is a self-driving car, fully autonomous, that drove across the entire city from east to west under full autonomy, and we haven't approved that. And he said there was a Tesla. Now, he's not talking about a normal Tesla. Bosch, who produces componentry for cars, are building a self-driving component vehicle. Guess who's funding it? The government. Right. So the transport minister, his own government, is funding this thing, and he's complaining and he's driving, yeah. and they drive across the sea. But my point is, it's actually happening today. Look at what Uber's doing in, I think, uh, they're doing Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Yeah. Philadelphia. Yeah. Do you know that Singapore has got self-driving taxis yeah. without drivers in a quarter of the city? If that uh, goes well, they don't kill too many people this year. By next year, it'll be fully across Singapore. If you have self-driving taxis in Singapore, why can't you have them in every city of the world? Yeah. 
No, well, I, I saw that. They've, they've just started rolling it out. And the other thing that's going to happen, of course, I say, is that Uber is going to have to buy Ford or Ford is going to have to buy Uber. They have to be, become a manufacturer, simple yeah. as that, because all, Google can just create a, an Uber platform. They can create the platform, but my point is that, that right now the, manu- the, the biggest cost is the cost of the metal and the componentry inside the car, and only a manufacturer with scale can produce that cost at a low cost. Mm. The software is actually the cheap part. Well, it's funny because, yeah, I've been looking at, I guess, hardware manufacturers, which car manufacturers, and the opportunities that they show because I just think that the the model of car manufacturing is just going to completely change. I mean, so going back to the, the point before, where do you see, if you can any at all right now, the opportunities? Can you see certain models developing with electric vehicles and autonomous cars? Uh, Look, I'm not a futurist, and and every time I've tried to forecast the future on anything I'm wrong, I'll give you an example. I was two years into IBM, Mm. and I'd sold the first personal computer when I was working at at Tandy called the TRS-80. It's the first production one. So one of the directors of IBM Australia came to me, and I'm just two years out of uni, takes me for a walk, puts his arm around my shoulders and says, Adrian... We, you've got some experience with this thing called the PC. We're about to bring out a new product called the IBM PC. So Bill Gates is not rich yet. He's about to become very, very, very rich because mm. it was on using Bill Gates software. And we want you to be the guy that, that sets up the channels and gets this new product going in the Australian marketplace. And I looked at him and said, I'll think about it. I'll come back to you. I spoke it over my parents and I said, you know what? There's no future in PCs. It's all mainframes. So I'm not the world's best futurist, <laughs> uh, but I definitely have some thoughts. I think full autonomy is going to come much, much quicker than we think. Mm-hmm. It'll be a step change. Uh, Twenty, If you wait till 2020, it'll be too late. Uh, Elon Musk has already said 2018 he'll have full self-driving cars. Yeah. We, and he's always, you know, he's, he's always late. So somewhere around there we'll have full autonomy, absolutely, 2018, 19, 20, full autonomy. Uh, I think the manufacturers and the software companies will start merging because of that cost mm-hmm. uh, you won't buy cars anymore they'll 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 rent them out to you by the by the minutes yeah why would they need to have dealerships so the dealerships if you own a car dealership you're in deep shit yeah you are gone it's, yeah. you have 20 years to get mm-hmm. the the dregs maybe five years not even somewhere in that ten, range maybe 10 yeah. when we take some bets five to ten years the dealerships are gone because there's no need for them so those are massive changes yeah it's interesting. I mean, like I said, I, my opinion is that it will just become – all that stuff will become transported as a service. I think that, you know, for someone like yourself who wants the the ability to have their own car with, you know, all these sort of modifications, that will still be there, but it will become more expensive. Well, and even that I'm concerned about. So when I ordered my Tesla, I was so – sure that I would miss driving a petrol-powered car with real engine in it, that I bought the Maserati that I loved in America. I found the second-hand one in Australia. And talk about depreciation, by the way. From 250000 new, I bought it six years, eight years old for 50000 mm-hmm. And it sits in my garage. I don't drive it. Because yeah. every opportunity, I think I'm going to go drive my Maserati, which has got beautiful that sound, noise, it handles... I just think it's shit compared to the Tesla. Yeah, it's so, never, I mean, never the same again. Yes, yeah, so these people who say I'll always miss a car, well, they're the same people who always love their horses, aren't they? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> now, while we're on the topic of startups and perhaps maybe swing to angel investing, you know, for people who are startups out there, do you have any criteria for the types of investments that you go for? You know, is it a particular type of founder, a particular type of company? Yeah, I go for the ones that land in front of my nose because I have absolutely no discretion whatsoever. Okay. I, t- I, I, I like people. Yeah, so you're so quite agnostic. I am quite agnostic, and if I meet people I like, yep. I want to support them. Yeah. So the sneaky way to get me to invest in your business 
is not to ask me for money because I get defensive and negative straight away. Yep. I'm going to start picking holes in what you're doing. Let me get a chance to like you. Okay. So come and book one of my office hour sessions. So just go to my Twitter profile, yep. Small Time P- VC. It's an opportunity for you to get me to like you. It takes me about two minutes for that to occur. Let's talk through your business. What is your roadblocks? Let me help you with something. Let me get emotionally invested in your business. And if you go and do something, come back to me six, eight, ten weeks later with some growth, you know, some change you did in the business and lie and tell me that I had something to do with it and that you want to catch up again, that's starting to get to be a pretty good time to stick a deck under my nose and ask for money. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because I remember we met through the, those office hours of the first time I came into, I think it was for a 20-minute session. You okay? Yeah, so it was quite interesting. It was very good. Did we cover anything useful? Um, yeah, that I shouldn't be doing what I was doing. <laughs> was I right? Yeah, you were very right. Okay. <laughs> so 20 minutes uh, to save you, uh, you know, 20 years, years of your life. Years. years. Um, so then if, if it's purely about the right type of person, what are the skills or attributes that you generally look for in founders? Now, I know that you've spoken in the past about you generally only like to focus on teams that have a component of engineering in it, as you know, like at least two founders. Are there any particular skills or attributes that you look for? Well, I th- I'll, let me just cover that point really, really quickly. There are lots of schools of thought and, and you have to break your own rules for everything. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, for example, with AngelCube, we set that philosophy up from day one that we'd only ba- invest in balanced teams, so multiple founders and tech. We've broken our own rules twice, single founders, no tech, and they're probably our two best startups. But that's not statistically valid <clears throat> for anything. That doesn't prove or disprove anything mm. other than those two occasions that happened, the universe happened to align. Yeah. But it does mean you have to be prepared to break your rules. Yeah. The main thing I looked at, and the other thing I think is that there's a logical reason, <clears throat> excuse me, why you need tech in your team. If I was going to open up a sausage factory making premium sausages, I know I want the taste and I can taste the sausage. Wouldn't it be nice to have somebody in my team that actually knows how to make a sausage Mm. and knows that even if I'm outsourcing it, that knows if the quality is good, knows if they're being made the right way, knows, you know, if it's not going to blow up in my face and poison when I people when I sell it. You need to have some. Your business is technology. If your business is technology, and you have to have, have someone who knows about technology. Such a brilliant analogy. I love sausages it. Sausages and technology. Thank yeah. you. Sausages and tech. <laughs> We're going to start a new podcast called Sausages and Tech. <laughs> the offshoot of one common sense. <laughs> I bet you no one else is called that. Yeah. Sausages and tech. So I to like come it. back to what I look for in the founder, number one is I've got to, you've got to connect personally. I want founders who are happy to talk to me and who I'm happy to talk to. Mm. And that we can have an open conversation like this and they can go ahead and do whatever they want after we talk Mm. because they know their business, I don't know their business. They're in the day-to-day, I'm not. I'm involved, they're committed. You know the difference between involvement and commitment? It's bacon and eggs on your plate in the morning. The chicken was involved, the pig was committed. (laughs) So founders are pigs, I'm sorry, and I'm a chicken, I lay eggs. Yeah. And then I can walk away. So I'll give you some cash. (laughs) Another brilliant analogy. And the other thing is, but they have to have an open learning mind. Okay. So you want to get people uh, who you're happy to have a beer with, who you're happy to invite to your place to have dinner and meet your friends. That's nice because you're going to spend a lot of time off and on with these people. But the most important skill is they have to have an open learning mind. Yeah, I completely agree because you've, you know, when they're when they're not aware that they're doing wrong, you have to be able to convince them that potentially they're not. And look, they might be right, they might be wrong, but at least have a listen to what I, what I have to say, and not just me, what other people around you have to say. No one's telling you what you have to do. You can go and do the diametrically opposite thing as long as you've considered the facts. Yeah, that's what you. That's why you get the big bucks. We hope one day. Now, if anyone was hearing this and from an alternative point of view was wanting to get into angel investment or venture capital, and I know that you've had involvement with, uh, you started an organization called the Chairman's Org. Investors Org. Investors Org. Correct. Good research. Um, What would you say to them if they were considering, because I see that one of the problems is, uh, you know, particularly with high net wealth individuals, they get burned on one investment and they never come back. 
Yeah, we started, in fact, Investors Org wasn't my idea. The idea came from two guys, a guy named Hani, mm-hmm. Hani Farm, and <laughs> he's a great guy, Hani. He, he, we have a demo day for Angel Cube every year, which is invitation only. Okay. And it's, we invite investors, obviously, and we have our startups on stage pitching, and we're very careful and curate who we bring in. Mm-hmm. And two guys come in, there wearing suits, and I think these two guys must be investment bankers or something like that, because they're actually wearing suits at a startup event. Mm-hmm. And they come and start talking to me, and what they've done is they've hacked their way into our event. I don't know how they got an invite. They've got a startup called OneTouch, which wow. is now called Breeze Docs. And not only do they come to my event, but they're pitching me all night at my own startup event for our startups to get outside investment and they successfully get money out of me. Wow. And I become their first investor. So we have this relationship. So I invest in Harney's company called Breeze Docs uh, about three years ago and they're doing quite well. But anyway, uh, cut forward to, to the question. Harney and Brian Goldberg. Brian Goldberg is a very good tra- a trademark attorney out of Melbourne called... Uh, called uh, What's he called? Trademark Doc Ventures. Okay. Brian Goldberg. You should definitely, if you if you need trademarks for your startup, and I guess you do at some stage, Brian's your guy. But they approached me to set up this investors org organisation. They wanted me to be uh, founding chairman, which I did. And Harney made the point. What he said was, "What we need more money in the Australian startup ecosystem. Mm. Where are we going to get it from? We can get it from VC funds." There weren't that many VC funds three years ago. The superannuation funds weren't putting money in yet, but now they are. So the VC market is growing now, but it wasn't growing then. We need angel investors, but they're not investing very widely. We need wealthy people, and we need people who sold their businesses like you to put money into startups. We need to create a new group of angel investors. But what we don't want to see happen is that somebody sells their business for $5 million and wants to invest $500,000 into startups. And then their nephew comes along with the best startups since last spread because all startups are amazing. They put their $500,000 into that one startup and it's gone. Hmm. It's gone because they're going to lose their money. That startup is going to fail. Well, it's just portfolio theory, isn't it? it? It's the only area of investment, which my other passion, I could talk about this for hours. Yeah. It's the only area of investment that I believe 100% in, in portfolio theory. Same. Yeah. Everything else I do is not portfolio. Mm. I concentrate my, my investments in like, I'm going to, my, my stock market investments, which are very small percentage of my portfolio, lithium stocks for batteries and marijuana stocks. Yeah. Take it to the bank. That's making me money over the next five, 10, 20 years. Yeah. That's all. I don't need to diversify. But with startups, you have to. Yeah. The stats are clear. Here's, well, it's just a numbers game, isn't it? All right. Here's the numbers for you. If you are a new angel investor, and if you invest in five or fewer startups, so think about that's five, that's a lot of startups, you've got a 50-50 chance of even just recovering your money. Right. If you invest in 10 startups, and this is US stats, over 3,500 angel investments. It's a big study that the Kaufman Foundation did. If you invest in 10 startups, you've got an 80% return of getting that one hit one that's actually going to make you the money. Right. If you invest in 20 startups, you get to about a 95% chance. Right. So this so, is just the probability of it happening. Correct. It's yeah. pure probability. Okay. Yeah, it's it, it's pure. It, it's quite amazing, isn't it? Like when you think about it, it is, it is all just a numbers game. And so it's a matter of, but in saying that, is it the matter of cultivating the right type of startups as well, not necessarily just all startups? Like if you went and started, invested in 10 startups that, I don't know, are doing software as a service only, you know, you'd probably say that the probability of a return is lower in that segment of the market, right? Yeah, may, maybe, maybe not. I'm not certain about what the portfolio theory says about concentrating into one area of the market. Mm. I would suggest you're probably right because for the very simple reason that there might be a new technology that comes along that completely replaces software as a service. Yeah. We can't imagine what it is because it's new technology. Uh, and then your whole investment could go to hell in a handbasket yeah. overnight. So that's probably an issue. But I think the important thing is that, that you have some domain experience so you actually understand what you're investing in and that you've got the ability to add value. Yeah. So as an, as, an, as an investor, you should also be an advisor. Mm-hmm. If you can't do those three things, then you're probably not making a wise investment. Yeah. 
before I'm wary, wary of your time, but before we jump into our quick questions, are there any particular lessons that you've learnt being in venture capital no. over the last few years? I don't learn like, anything. <laughs> <laughs> like any great hits or misses that have taught you about investing generally? Well, yeah, the hits, uh, very simple. Uh, I've, I've officially got one unicorn in my portfolio. Okay. And I only realised that when I checked the press on it that they raised uh, $50 million just to get that, hundred, uh, that $1 billion valuation. Uh, but I already exited 60% of that uh, a couple of years ago when it was a quarter unicorn. Mm-hmm. And that was so, that, so that investment is paying for my whole portfolio yeah. and put some cash in my pocket and was pure fluke, pure luck. Yeah. So my first ever investment, a friend came to me and said, uh, I'm doing this new thing. Do you want to put 100K in? We've got uh, Osark Ventures are putting in 4 million. Friends and family putting in 900,000. Do you want to put the last 100K in to make it even million? I said, sure, go ahead. Here it is. And I had no idea what the startup did, really. I had no idea how to value a startup. I had no idea what I was signing. He gave me a bunch of documents to Instick. I just signed it and sent it back because it was a friend. Right. And that's my best ever investment. So the lesson there is you can go put all the thinking you like. <laughs> God, that is so good. <laughs> it taught me an awful lot. <laughs> what, what was the company out of interest, can you say? Yeah, it was public domain. In fact, I put a tweet out there. Last night, it's called Sev1, S-E-V-O-N-E. It's an American company, Philadelphian founder, two Bulgarians, a uh, husband and wife, a genius as PhDs who invented this, this network appliance. Don't even ask me what that means. And I knew we were onto something good when Mike, my friend in Philadelphia, Skyped me and uh, said to me that Apple had signed the contract for this stuff and paid three years up front, which is like eight million bucks. Wow. I thought if Apple's buying this shit, it must three be... Three years up front? Yeah, it must be good shit. Wow. <laughs> I think that's what he said. And don't, it's, <laughs> I'm not sure that's even confidential. I can't be. It was five years ago he told me this. Yeah. So I knew I was onto something. Yeah. Anyway, so now it's a unicorn. Okay. All right. I want to roll into some quick questions. I know that you spoke that um, intra- introspective stuff is, is not your thing, but mm-hmm. we'll, we'll do our best. Is there any particular books that you believe have assisted you over the years or you know like are there any go-to books that when you want to gift someone something that you go to from a business perspective the book that changed my life was a book called the e-myth revisited ah yeah so it's a famous famous book yeah and uh i think the most recent book that would probably be on par with that would be the ben horowitz book from Anderson Horowitz and I can't remember what that book was called ah uh, you know yeah I know I know the one because I was listening to um, Mark Andreessen's podcast on yeah. Tim Ferriss recently and was the thesis of that book was simply that there are all these entrepreneurs and it was not aimed at startups it was aimed at small businesses and the thesis of the book was that there's all these people who do what I did when I was working at IBM they have these entrepreneurial seizures and decide they want to go in the business and don't have any of the skills and capability to run the business. Yeah. So it's like the hairdresser who is really good at cutting hair, so decides to open up a hairdressing salon. That's the last thing that he should open up as a hairdressing salon, uh, should go and do some business where they're not tempted to be a technician. They've got to learn to be a business person. And that book changed my life because it made me sit down. The very first exercise in that book maybe sit down and put a basic life financial plan together and that's why we went to america yeah now was this the so the, you were talking about the e-myth revisited yeah, there. the michael gerber book the other one that you mentioned was the hard thing about hard things yes probably, that's the ben yes. horowitz book yeah. yeah i read some of that i got bored halfway oh, okay <laughs> or because i sold my business i don't need to read business yeah. Read business books. Are there any? I thought about writing one, but I thought, well, there's enough people out there who've written business books. I probably don't need to do. Add, I can't add a lot of value to that. Any books outside of the space of investing that have, or business that have really changed your mind or perspective? Well, not outside of investing. So the next set of books that really helped me were personal finance books. 
Oh, I knew okay. nothing about personal finance, and this was around about the same time as I read that book. I read Rich Dad Poor yeah, Dad. Yeah, that's the first ever business book. Business book that I read. Yeah, yeah. And the second one I read after that was uh, the Richest Man in Babylon. Yes, which is a series of of fables, stories about this guy. Ten percent of your gold. Yeah, yeah, about gold. If you, I think everybody has to read those. Probably three books. Or yeah, the equivalent business book plus those two personal finance books. And look, the thing like that, Rich Dad Poor Dad taught me was that a liability is something an asset is something that puts money in your pocket a liability is something that takes money out of your pocket yeah so for example when you think about buying a car it takes money out of your pocket it's going to depreciate it's going to cost you money you're never going to sell it for more than you paid for it it's a liability yeah but think about a house yeah what rent do you get from a house that you're living in yeah so all those things no i think it's a very particularly at a young age it's a very informative book i mean it just starts to implant the idea of assets and liabilities and what a job versus a business does for you and assets as opposed yeah. to a business does for you because a lot of people just think oh, I'm okay i'm going to go be an entrepreneur but all, sometimes for a lot of people it's just replacing your job with another job but in this case you've got to earn the money yourself it's not as easy and it's not for everyone you know what's interesting is that people some people go into startups or doing a business because they don't like to work for somebody else. And what they don't realise, they don't like the politics or they don't like sucking up to people. Let me tell you something, that when you go into your own business, you've now not got one boss, you've got four or five bosses. Mm. Number one, your spouse. <clears throat> your spouse is going to be on your case every day of the week if you're married to bring some money in the door because you used to have a stable income, you don't have any anymore. If you think about having any children, it's really, really difficult. Uh, your bank manager, if you're borrowing money for the bank, or if it's not a bank manager, it's going to be a VC. You're totally beholden to them. You have board meetings. Uh, your customers, mm -hmm. if you're dealing with enterprise customers and you're seeing face-to-face, -face, every single customer means so much to you, you have to suck up to every single one of them. And you're getting, so you're getting bullshit from four or five different... Your staff, mm. okay? Your staff are important. If they leave, you're fucked. Yeah. So instead of having one boss who's a prick, you now got five. Yeah. That's, that's a good way to think about it. Maybe you're just, you're giving the perfect criteria for people to vet as to whether they want, even want to get into startups at all. Yeah, you've got to think that through and, uh, and you know, you've got to be in it for other reasons, obviously. Yeah. Are there, do you, I mean, you, we spoke about it before at the start about, you know, what you do for breakfast normally. Do you have any morning rituals? Like, do you read the paper or anything like that? Uh, I'm really, really bad at getting up. So. And I'm really, really bad at going to sleep. So my ideal, and my wife and I have got this issue because she likes to wake up early. She's now taking up golf. So she'll be up at the crack of dawn going wow. up golfing. I'll be in bed. And the only reason why I have to wake up is the guilty feeling that somebody's got to feed the, uh, feed the dog. Yeah. So 7.30, 8.30, I'll go get up and feed the dog. I take so long to get ready in the morning for no reason whatsoever <laughs> that I, could, I have to allow two hours minimum before any meeting I'm going to, and even then I probably won't get time for breakfast. Yeah. Okay. What am I doing for two hours? I Look, I'm the same. I'm just not a good early starter. And then going to sleep at night, I'll do everything I can not to go to bed. And then once I'm in bed, I'll just check my phone really quickly, and I'll go cycle through Twitter. Then I better go check Facebook, and then I better go check Quora, and maybe answer a couple of questions on Quora, uptick a few <laughs> comments, and then I better go back to Twitter again. Oh, I better double check LinkedIn. Oh, LinkedIn's crap. Go back to Facebook, and then I'll put the phone down eventually. And I'm gonna sleep in two minutes. Yeah. Boom. It's two o'clock in the morning by then. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the late wake up. Yes. Do you meditate or anything like that? I've been through all this cycle. I, I've got an old family movie about my daughter when she was like six years old. She's got my headphones on, like you've got headphones on now. Yeah. And she gets up from the bed and she says, I've been meditating. I'm not angry anymore. <laughs> Clearly, I was a very angry person. Really? And the reason for it was uh, when I was going through this transition phase of moving from a small business to moving to a larger business in the USA that was all driven by a need to grow the business and really realise I had to become a startup. Right. I had to go on the high growth curve. Yeah. And that entailed a whole bunch of very, very stressful processes. I had to go to the US. I had to negotiate a joint venture, which is a three-way joint venture between me, the US subsidiary of a, of a multinational being lease plan, the global head office in Europe, 
and it was a twenty million and a twenty million dollar outsourcing five year outsourcing contract. Wow. This is coming from a guy who had twenty staff in Melbourne, biggest client was worth, you know, a million bucks a year. And it was a joint venture agreement. And we had to get visas and move countries and do everything all at the same time. I arrived in America, I was close to a basket case. Mm. Stressed. Well, I mean, it's understandable, right? Yeah, my wife, well, not as understandable for my wife, but she looked at me and she said, Adrian, there was that, uh, there's that uh, seminar in, in uh, Sedona, that retreat you've been talking about going to for years. Time for you to go. Yeah. And that's when I met my friend from Philadelphia who started Sev1, by the way. Oh, no way. He just sold a business going through a very stressful uh, court case with one of his co-founders from his old business. And we met there about the same age, and we just hit it off like a house on fire. But anyway, so I went to Sedona for a week, and I went on a retreat, and I started meditating. And I got me, it got me into Eastern philosophy. Okay. And uh, I went through that process for a few years, and uh, I actually have a guru, believe it or not. So you've done TM? Yeah. Sorry? You've done transcendental meditation no, then? No, I've or? done other things, but adv- Advaita, non-duality okay. is my guru comes from that. And what's really interesting is that there is, I've just read now, there's one degree of separation between me and Leonard Cohen. Really? We, we had the same American guru, a guy named Wayne Lickerman, at right. Hermosa Beach in California. And his guru is a guy in India named Ramesh Balkazar, who used to be the uh, president of the Bank of India, Yeah. who suddenly discovered... You know the lights, so he did that. But anyway, but you know, I've, I've so that that helped me for seven to ten years. I don't meditate so much now, but I'm a much calmer person. You, but you can. Uh, it seems that f- sometimes for the right people, sometimes as well for startups in particular, if they're going through intense times, maybe that it is the right thing. There's a case lot of, by case. Yeah, there's a lot of mindfulness stuff that's out now. A lot. Yeah. If you don't meditate, I encourage you to try it. Yeah. It certainly helped me an awful lot. Yeah. Are the the one that I spoke about before, any amazing purchases that you've had over the last few years that are under $200? Under $200. A book, a tool, an object of some variety? You know, I I make so many amazing purchases because I'm absolutely addicted to Kickstarter. Yes, I saw that. And my thing is headsets. I mean, earphones particularly, and headphones. So I'm always changing, upgrading my headphones. So I've just bought my Bose Bluetooth uh, Quiet Comfort 35s. Okay. Uh, Nate, I was debating between that and the Sennheiser ones. So I passed on my, my mind you, my old Sennheiser was 600 bucks a pair. I bought them a year ago and gave them to my wife. Yeah. So she's happy. And earphones. And I realized on Kickstarter, I'm buying so many Kickstarter earphones that the new version of something is out before the old one's even delivered. Really? Yeah. So now I'm looking forward to the Apple AirPods. Yes. And so that's it. AirPods or, or bust. Air, AirPods or bust. Well, I've got the B&Os. They're quite nice. I was going to go for Sennheiser. But they're but wired. They are. And the reason why I went for that is because I don't like having to charge things repeatedly. Because oh. I travel a bit for work. I hate carrying around so many different types of chargers. So that was the rationale behind You'll it. You'll try the Bose Quite Comfort 35, especially for traveling. Yeah. Because they're Bluetooth. You keep in a little bag. They're 20 hours. They're amazing. 20 hours. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I think at the time I was just like, no, nah, I'm sick of charging things. And there's no cables. So you unplug them, stick them on your head, press a button. There's no connection. Just press the button and they're on. You're tempting me yeah, to get tempting. a new pair. Is, is there something that you believe in that nearly no one agrees with you on? You know, like uh, I think it's, uh, what's his name? Peter Thiel has this question. It's what important truth do very few people agree with you on? Or what insight about life seems obvious to you but not to others? Probably probably two things. One on the personal stuff is the stuff that I guess I picked up through my Eastern journey, my 10-year Eastern you know, mythology sort of stuff. There's no, there's no truth in that. So I, I'm spiritual. I, I believe in a higher power. Mm-hmm. But I have absolutely no belief in religion whatsoever. Yeah. Because, I mean, if I was some sort of higher power... Why would I bother setting rules up for all these people on earth and, you know, do all that sort of stuff? So I, I believe that. You know, I, I'd probably like to believe that there are aliens and more intelligence, you know, world out there, but there's absolutely no proof of that. And in fact, uh, the proof is quite the opposite. They must know about us if they exist. Well, have you read the Fermi Paradox? Yeah, of course. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, you know, I believe subtly in all that. And, and I believe that in our lifetimes, the aliens will land and will say, take me to your leader, because I just want to see all that. Uh, on a more practical point of view, my passion, real passion, is not around startups. It's actually around personal finance. Because okay. I think that everything that's out there that's being written today is absolute crap. Yeah. And I just don't believe that you can save your way to wealth. Okay. This whole idea of saving is important, but not for the reasons of saving your way to wealth. Yeah. And this idea of paying off debt and leaving debt free and frugal, I can promise you, is setting you up for a life of misery. Mm. Might sound great when you're in your 20s and 30s, but by the time you've got children and you want to put them through school and you want to travel a bit and those expenses, you'll be damn sorry that you're living a frugal life. Yeah. Is that if you were to direct anyone to start maybe looking at their own personal finance, where what direction would you push them in? I would push them to my upcoming blog post. So I've okay. now finally relaunched the Medium uh, cha- uh, why don't we call them channel publications. I'm doing two publications. Okay. One on startups. Yeah. I'm about to do my first post on that. And then one on personal finance. I'm going to do my first post on that. Follow me on Twitter and they'll both... They'll both be up soon. Yeah. Well, I guess one of the things we'll have is everything will be linked from this episode yeah. so that people can come to it later on. Um, so that'd be, I'm really interested to see that. So my personal finance stuff is written for an American audience. Mm-hmm. My startup stuff is obviously written for the Australian startup scene. I'll be almost embarrassed if people read my personal finance stuff because it's such out there thinking. But when it's all finished, I'm actually going to write a book and I'm hoping people will read it, listen to it and take it to heart, particularly younger people. Yeah. Last question I have is on success. Do you ever think of someone or factors that you attribute towards success? Like when you go and look at Bill Gates or Elon Musk, you go, oh, that's success. How do you sort of measure it or look at it? What I don't measure on is money. Okay. Uh, Because it's like gunslinging in the Wild West. I learned very early on that if you're Billy the Kid, you might shoot 99 people but that 100th person is going to be just that bit faster or luckier than you and is going to hit you with a bullet and you're dead. Yeah. It's the same thing with chasing money for money's sake. There's no measure on it whatsoever because all you're going to do is get jealous about the guy who's got more money than you. I promise you that. So you look at the guy with you know hundred thousand dollars. He looks at the guy with a million dollars. He looks at the guy with a ten million dollars, and it keeps going off until you're Bill Gates. And I promise you, Bill Gates has no yeah. care about how much money he has at all so it's not about money it's about what you do with your life Mm. and so success for me is people who are living the life that they want to live and contributing in the way they want to contribute and aren't doing it as a slave to the system yeah I mean and I I can understand that you'd have a very good perspective on this because you've done the game where you've done the chase for money you've made money from selling businesses How, how do you think that people could maybe find a way to focus on the things that they like you know we obviously have these pressures in life we have to make money but how could they make some actionable steps or i think that you have to have a direction i don't believe in goal setting i never have i don't believe in budgeting i never have because all those short-term things are very uh, very artificial Mm mm-hmm because they represent your life today and some incremental change in it. Mm -hmm. I believe totally the opposite. I believe you have to have a direction that sees you make non-incremental changes to your life and then go for it. Right. And so I think the first thing you have to do is think any business or job I've got, anything I do day to day is transitory. Mm -hmm. You're probably not going to want to do that for your entire life. Yeah. There's probably other things you want to be doing for your life to contribute. Yeah. Whether it's really small, like just being a you know good parent, looking after my family, or whether it's maybe making a difference to child you know to childhood diseases or volunteering. There's going to be some bigger picture in your life that you want to do. That actually, what you have to do every day is getting in the way of. Yeah. So I just simply encourage people to think about what that vision looks like. The bigger picture. The bigger picture. Yeah. And how much do you need? And do things along the way to get And how there. much time and money do you need to free you up to support doing that? Yeah. And for me, that was like five years. I wanted five years of working then to be free to do this. I like to speak to people mm. about this sort of stuff. I wanted to have time to go write my book mm-hmm. on personal finance, which I've waited 10 years to write. 
And I want the time to go and invest in startups because that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. So I've done two out of the three things I want to be doing and none of them allow me to sit there nine to five earning a job because I don't have the time. Yeah. So I figured that the cost of that lifestyle for me and to travel a lot, the cost of that lifestyle for me is about 250000 bucks a year. Multiply that by about twenty, and that's how much money I need in the bank to to, to drive to yeah. drive that. Yeah. And so once you get whatever, and that might be fifty times twenty for you, fifty thousand a year times twenty is enough. Or it might be five hundred thousand, a million dollars a year for you for whatever reason, because maybe you want to be a, an astronaut or go to Mars. I don't know. Yeah. But whatever that number is that you need to live off, multiply that by twenty because that's like a 5% return okay. on investment. You can go live the life that you want for as long as you want, inf- adjusted for inflation. Why continue trying to make money once you're at that point? Mm. It's just getting in the way of what you really want to be doing. Yeah. And so when I got to that point, I had no interest in making more money. Okay. I'm just in capital preservation mode now, <laughs> except for investing in startups. Yeah. Well, that's a, look, it's a very good way to think about it. Um, if people wanted to, f- to find you, uh, Twitter, so at Small Time VC. Yep. Any other platforms that you're on? Obviously, Medium. Yep. Will be uh, will be the we'll best link, place. We'll link that. Which also be, I think, Small Time VC. Yep. I think is my medium, my you, medium name. You had a blog on Tumblr. Do you want to direct anyone in that? No, I'm going to change that. I'm gonna switch you're going to chuck that. Okay. I'm going to switch it over. Okay. All right. Well, look. Obviously, being wary of time, really appreciate you coming in and doing this. It's been great. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been uh, really quite enjoyable. Yeah. Surprisingly. (laughs) Cheers. Cheers. Before you head off, thank you for making it this far. It's been a real treat doing this. Like I said, make sure you head to neural.com slash podcast to learn about our prizes. Sign up to our weekly brain food called The Monday Morsels at neural.com slash sign up. That is N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E.com slash sign up. Leave us a review. It's really important to us that we can get quality reviews and build feedback as to whether to continue with this. Check us out on Facebook at Neural, N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E. Until next time, speak soon.